Sioux territory, a traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and shrubbing route to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Dakota Sioux. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuits whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine, and it is my pleasure to be introducing you to this year's 2021 Nelly Talks. What is Nelly Talks? Nelly Talks is a virtual video series made to empower young women by having strong, independent, and impactful female speakers from all different kinds of backgrounds speak about their careers and experiences. This event is hosted by the Nelly McClung All Girls Junior High program at Oliver School. This All Girls program is a junior high that focuses on empowerment and development of young women and establishing leadership skills in all those attending the school. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the Nelly McClung program and we want to celebrate that milestone with some special alumni speakers. For the past several years, Nelly students have been organizing and facilitating our annual Power of Woman event. At this large in-person event, speakers and students had the opportunity to interact in person. Unfortunately, due to the fact of the COVID-19 virus, we are unable to hold this uplifting and inspiring event in person. However, we believe this event will still be a motivational and eye-opening experience for those watching. We are honored and thankful to have the opportunity to prepare and host this event and are proud to say this event has been primarily created by the Nellie McClung students. However, we would not be able to bring this vision to life without the help from our teachers, staff, and the Nellie L. McClung Educational Society, who helped make this event possible. Without further ado, we would like to present our next speaker in our very first Nellie Talks event. Hello and welcome to Elevate Aviation's Nelly Talk. My name is Nova Andrews and I am the director of the Elevate Aviation Learning Center. I am here today with three incredible women who are not only part of the senior leadership team with Elevate Aviation, but are also have active careers in the aviation industry. We are very excited to have the opportunity to present to you today because at Elevate Aviation, it is our mission to provide a platform for women to succeed in life with a career in aviation. We have a number of support programs from the Learning Center to a mentorship program to a cross-country tour and an inspired gala, which all strive to explore, enrich, and excel women in aviation. So for our Nelly Talks presentation today, we have Chelsea Wright, Director of Sponsorship and Stakeholder Relations with Elevate and Safety Specialist with Edmonton International Airport. A wave there, Chelsea. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and we have Dina Jamaz. Director of Industry and Indigenous Partnerships with Elevate Aviation and a VFR air traffic controller with NAV Canada. Hey, Dina. Hi. And last but definitely not least is Sophia Wells, Director of Mentorship with Elevate Aviation and a Chief Flight Instructor with Edmonton Flying Club. Hey. Uh, Sophia, it looks like you are sitting in a plane. <laughs> yeah, mine as well. <laughs> well, that's perfect. Awesome. Okay, yep, so sitting in a Piper Seminole. A Piper, very cool. How many uh, passengers does that carry? Um, about four. You can see there's just a spot for oh dear co-pilot, <laughs> me, and a couple of passengers oh, in the back. Awesome. Mm -hmm. There's a perfect place for you to be doing this then. <laughs> Feels kind of All right. Too. So we'll fasten our seatbelts and learn a little bit about what these women do. Um, Dina, why don't we actually start with you? You, uh, you are a VFR air traffic controller. So can you, I guess, first tell us what VFR stands for and then exactly what air traffic controllers do? Well, VFR stands for visual flight rules, but uh, it differentiates us between the IFR controllers or the center controllers. So VFR controller would work out of a control tower. That's the tower you see at the airport. A lot of people may think when they hear air traffic controller that we're the people on the apron with the wands. Uh, that is an important job, but that's not what I do. I will sit in the tower and uh, safely separate aircraft within the control zone and send them on their way or bring them into the airport, and keep them separated. And it's our job to provide a safe, orderly, and expeditious flow of air traffic. Okay, so you mentioned you're in a tower. Are there other air traffic controllers? Yes, as I mentioned, there's IFR controllers. There's seven centers across Canada, which house the IFR controllers. And uh, Edmonton Center is located at the International Airport. 
It's a small building and there's about 200 IFR controllers located in that building. Not all at the same time, but that's how many work in there. A lot of people don't know about them. I'm in the tower and they're in the center. And oh, the type of aircraft they control, uh, for instance, maybe I clear someone for takeoff from the airport. As soon as they become airborne, they'll talk to an IFR controller, which will get them safely to their uh, next destination, at which uh, another tower controller will clear them to land at that airport. So all the airspace in Canada is divided up, and there are different air traffic controllers that take care of that particular airspace. That's incredible. So is there a lot of schooling involved with getting into being an air traffic controller? Becoming an air traffic controller is a, it's a very specialized schooling. So you can apply online with navcanada.ca and uh, you can do a practice test uh, and you can apply online by doing the test online. If you're successful, they'll contact you. And then you would go to the center that's in your area, one of the seven centers across Canada and you begin your training there. The length of training depends on which specialty or which type of air traffic service job that you're doing. In addition to tower controllers and area controllers, IFR controllers, there's also flight service specialists. They work at airports that don't have enough traffic to warrant an air traffic controller to be there. So they, they're uh, an advisory service for those airports. So it's busy enough to need someone to give the pilots a hand, but not too busy that they needed to be controlled and spaced out that way. So the length of training will depend, I suppose for a VFR controller from the pre or basic and then the uh, on the job training could take say a year, a year and a half uh, with IFR it's, uh, two, two and a half years. With flight service specialist be eight months to maybe a year and a half. It is a range because it depends on how long it takes for you to qualify they will give you the time to do it. Oh, that's amazing. And so do you do this right out of high school or do you need a college or university degree? There are no prerequisites to becoming an air traffic controller except grade 12. And uh, you need to be able to speak English proficiently and uh, no criminal record. But other than that, your education is, is basically you need grade 12 to be able to apply. Oh, that's so interesting. That's awesome. And so when you're controlling all those airplanes in the sky, is it really stressful? I would say that 95% of the job is routine, which is not to say that it's boring. It's, it's just uh, you're trained to do a certain way. And if everything goes right, everything goes smoothly and everyone knows their job and does what they do. Maybe 5% of the time, it could be stressful. If there are emergencies sometimes. Um, there's again, procedures in place. So it's uh, pretty safe. It's actually very safe. And uh, so stressful maybe when the weather goes down or if it gets really busy you might get a little bit stressful but uh, the more you do it and the training you have prepares you for that so it's pretty exciting rather than stressful I'd say. That's so cool. Okay Sophia let's move on to you a little bit as a chief flight instructor with Edmonton Flying Club. That sounds really important and <laughs> like a lot of responsibility so can you tell us a little bit about how you actually get to be a chief flight instructor? There must be a lot of schooling and things that go along with that. Um, not overly, actually. Uh, so oh. first of all, a lot of people get confused when they hear chief flight instructor and think I just am a manager, but I am still a pilot. Um, so uh, first of all, you have to start off with your flight training. So the way that that starts is you could actually start learning how to fly as young as 14 years old and you can get what's called a student pilot permit. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean we're just going to hand over the keys to a 14-year-old. That means you have to do some training, have your aviation medical. Um, and then when you're ready and your instructor thinks it's safe, you can go buy yourself in an airplane before you can drive a car. So it's pretty cool that way. Um, so you start off with your private pilot license, typically. And then after you've got that at 17, then you can start building onto some experience with some ratings, such as like a night rating, multi-engine rating, which is the type of plane I'm sitting in. An instrument rating, so learning how to fly in the clouds, and eventually your commercial pilot license. Once you have your commercial pilot license, which is about 200 hours of flying and takes most people about a year and a half to two years to complete if they, you know, do it all kind of together. Lots of people will space it out. For example, if you started at 14, you won't be able to get your commercial until you're 18, so it would take a little bit longer. And then once you have uh, your commercial license, then you can either continue on and get your instructor rating or you could start looking for various other types of flying jobs, such as like pipeline pilot or flying, you know, jumpers or, you know, various cargo and smaller aircrafts up north 
couple of you know, various other jobs uh, around the country, which is pretty cool. Um, to become a flight instructor, you have to do more training. And it's <laughs> about a six to 10 month course, usually, uh, where you actually get to pretend you're teaching your instructor. So it's a little bit schizophrenic during the training at time. Um, but it's a lot of fun and a lot of challenge, uh, challenging times of, of presenting and learning how to help other people learn. And uh, after you become a class four instructor, then you have to put time in. And after a couple of years of teaching and, and upgrading my ratings, because there's various different levels of, of instruction, I eventually got asked to uh, take over as the chief pilot. So chief pilot means that I'm in charge of operational control. So basically managing all the other pilots at the flight school, making sure that all of our instructing team are doing what they're supposed to and teaching to the standard set by Transport Canada. Oh, that hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just sounds so amazing. And so much like Dina, it's all specialized training then. You don't need to necessarily go to university or college or anything like that before focusing in on your career. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So um, like I said, you can start at 14. There's a lot of great schools right in the Edmonton area. Uh, I'm at the Edmonton Flying Club. So obviously I can come here. <laughs> but there's uh, there's schools at Villeneuve Airport, Wetasco and Cooking Lake, even Josephberg Airport. Uh, so lots of opportunity depending on you know what's close to you and what type of school you'd like to go to. And um, yeah, you can like I said, you a lot of people that become pilots can actually be working as pilots before many of their friends are even halfway through their university training. Uh, uh, that being said, it's still great to get, you know, higher education in other ways. So there's great programs such as the Grant McEwen program, which is a business aviation program right here in Edmonton, where you can get a business diploma while getting credits for all of your flight training. So your private license, your commercial, all of that count towards your college education, which is pretty neat. There's also programs like Mount Royal University and things like that, too, depending on what else you're wanting. Uh, we also, a lot of our, our students will get all their flight training done with us. And then on the side, maybe they're getting a degree in, you know, whatever they like it could be agriculture, it could be anything, right? So that's kind of the neat thing about it is that you can do more than one thing if you like. That's really incredible. Um, okay, so now we've talked with Dina and Sophia, who are both very obviously in aviation careers. <laughs> but we also have Chelsea here, and she is a safety specialist with Edmonton International Airport. So Chelsea, can you tell us a little bit about what look, working for an airport looks like and what you do as a safety specialist? Hi everyone. So yeah, working for an airport is completely different than anyone thinks. A lot of people think when they go to the airport, usually the airline that they're flying with, whether that's WestJet, Air Canada, Air Transat, that's kind of who takes over the airport. But a lot of people don't know that the airport is actually run by a non-for-profit organization. So we are actually are our own entity and we have around 300 staff members that operate the terminal air side and ground side 24 seven. So the airport is just like any other large company. Uh, it's just, we're really specialized in a certain industry. So my job as a safety specialist here at the airport is to make sure that all of our passengers and public get through our terminal safely. And as well as our employees come to work safe and then leave just as safe going home to their families at the end of the day. So a big role that I play is uh, a lot of occupational health and safety work. Um, and that's basically anything from making sure everyone's using their ladders correctly to dealing with workplace injuries, to dealing with workplace violence and harassment claims. It's kind of a very broad spectrum. Uh, but I like to focus on the four topics of safety in an airport though. So we have occupational health and safety, public safety, emergency planning and preparedness, and aviation SMS. So the four topics um, kind of take you in any direction that you want to go. You don't have to specialize or you can if you want. Uh, aviation SMS is a little bit different as you're dealing with all the safety air side. So the planes coming in to the ground handlers loading the planes to the um, tower controllers, we're all communicating with them and making sure everyone's working safely. Uh, Chelsea, why don't you just define SMS to the girls here so that they understand what it stands for? Yeah, so SMS is safety management systems. I just assume Perfect. everyone knows that, but nobody knows. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course. Um, so Chelsea, have you always worked in, in aviation then and, and at the airport? No, so I actually started out uh, pretty young. I started out in an emergency response field, so in firefighting, volunteer firefighting. 
Um, and I did that throughout high school and a little bit after high school. And I needed to make that decision of if I wanted to continue on in my firefighting career or if I wanted to move towards more of a, a workplace prevention um, kind of area. So I moved towards workplace prevention and that took me into oil and gas, kind of like the Alberta dream for everyone growing up, right? <laughs> So I went and worked up north for a couple of years, lived that lifestyle, and it was great because oil and gas have such a high safety standard and they taught me everything I needed to know to kind of move into a different industry. Um, I seen the airport was hiring and I applied on this position and yeah, I was lucky enough to get an interview and then lucky enough to be hired. So complete transition 360 from what I was doing before, but safety carries, up, uh, carries along in all industries. So. Absolutely. It's just nice to hear there's, you know, so many different pathways into aviation and um, obviously in so many different, uh, different careers as well. So, you know, it's very obvious that all three of your jobs are very different. Um, so why don't you share with us maybe a little bit about some daily challenges and what those look like in your jobs. And then I don't know, maybe you've got some insight or some ideas as to like what types of personalities might be the best fit for your type of job. Um, Sophia, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so being a pilot, I mean, there's lots of different pilot jobs out there. I've talked about being a flight instructor, but there's also so many others. Lots of these girls have probably heard of airline pilots or military pilots, helicopter pilots. So, you know, there's all kinds of variety there. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the most exciting things about flying jobs is that maybe I instruct for a little while and then I'm like, oh, I, I want to try being an air ambulance pilot. And so then I can apply and go in that for a couple of years and um, I've gotten into the corporate world now and I really love that. So that's one of the coolest things about, I think, flying is that no day is ever the same, um, not just with, you know, the opportunity to try different things, but also even as a, as a flight instructor today, for example, I was talking to, a, I did a career fair earlier. And then before that, I had a flight this morning with a student on, on uh, learning how to like private pilot was getting ready for his flight test. And then tomorrow I have a different day. And today, you know, like, so it's, there's always things that are changing, which is, I think, a big part of what's so much fun about it, as well as the emergency training, uh, like Chelsea mentioned, and, and Dina too, our jobs are so much about safety. So we're constantly learning, we're constantly re-challenging ourselves and making sure those emergency procedures are just that fresh. And so that I find really great because I get bored really easily. And so without having that variety, I think uh, that was a, a big part, which then leads into the personality traits of I think if you like to be challenged, if you like to learn, um, those are big parts of being a pilot, as well as if you, you know, love to see beautiful views, <laughs> I don't know if that's a personality trait or not. Um, you do have to, I think in anything in aviation though, you do have to be willing to put the work in because everyone in the industry expects you to put your best foot forward and expects the best out of you. So uh, there's a lot of hard work involved. So you have to be, you know, determined and, and a hardworking individual, as well as um, being able to go with the flow. Because as much as you're trained and you have all these procedures and standard operating procedures and checklists and such, uh, sometimes things go funny and you have to be willing to adapt and overcome. Yeah, that sounds like um, kind of like what you were saying there, Dina, as well, that there are some definite rules and, and regulations and the standard kind of days, but you must also have challenges in your day that yeah, when things see, don't go so quite I, right. Yeah. So far, you really stole my thunder there. That's just exactly it. <laughs> I'm <because>. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every day is a little different. Uh, when you come into this job, you do need to be focused and determined. The training is very difficult and uh, it is hard to get through and it's still very worth it in the end. So I, I'll just be reiterating everything Sophia said. So you just go ahead. And <laughs> I'll see next. Fair what enough, about personality though? Personality for a controller may be different than personality for a pilot though. Yeah. I find there's a lot of similarities. I work a lot with both. But uh, like I said, determination and focus. Are, and like Sophia said, the challenge is uh, we forgot to throw in shift work. Because I think with pilots, mm. you fly at any time. You could be flying at, the min at midnight. Right. You could be flying at four in the morning. Shift work is, is one of the challenges. Uh, something you need to get used to and understand it's going to be part of your life. Uh, weather, uh, something, sometimes something may happen. You need to be trained and prepared for those things. And, and I think we all have that in common as well. So I'm just going to be seeing exactly what Sophia said. And I just, I agree with everything you said. And Chelsea, if you can add anything to that, please. Yeah, and Chelsea, how about your job? I mean, again, a little bit different, but when you when they uh, are focused so much on safety, there's obviously a lot of similarities too. 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing that sticks out for me when I talk about my career is you have to be um, very good and confident at delivering your message. So usually as a safety specialist or a safety manager, you have to deliver a lot of messages people don't want to hear um, mm. and then at certain times. So say you're a passenger traveling through the airport and you slip and fall and then you miss your flight. And then I'm the one that has to come down to you and ask if you're all right and do a formal investigation and make sure that you're back up on your feet. A lot of people in that mindset don't want to deal with anyone around them, especially someone that they don't know. Uh, so being really confident and knowledgeable in your approach is really important. And then you can even take it to the next level and say you're working with an employee. Uh, that employee could be a male. He could be 60 years old. And to have a 25-year-old female telling him something that you may be able to work on or do better uh, sometimes is very hard. So being confident and knowledgeable, I think, is really important. Um, and a skill set, always having a backbone uh, standing up for what's right, no matter what. Safety has a lot of legislation in it. So there is a right and a wrong answer. It is black and white. And sometimes people don't, uh, don't want to hear that. But as long as you have the confidence to do that, I think you'll be successful. And then one more thing, you have to be very personable. Safety is all about building relationships. So I'd say on a daily basis, I talk to 20 to 60 people, depends on the day. And each of them has a different uh, style of communicating and a different way to build relationships. So you have to adjust to whatever that person you're working with and you have to be able to do it quickly. Uh, so if you're good at relationship building and you have good at communication skills and you're confident, then I think it's a good position for you. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, all of your jobs actually sound fairly detail oriented. Is there a lot of paperwork involved? Is there a lot of... Um, yeah, like technical types of things that you guys have to deal with on a regular basis? That's a great question. Uh, for flying, there definitely is in the sense of uh, every pilot has to know their systems. So you need to know your aircraft inside and out. Now, that doesn't mean I have to know how to take it apart and put it back together. But I have to understand, for example, OK, the fuels in the wings. So how does the fuel then go from the wings to the engine? And what are all the things along the way that could get or cause an issue so that if something does go wrong, I can troubleshoot and then make the decision of, okay, I need to divert and land somewhere else or no, this is something when we get to the place, then we can deal with, or, or you know, what is, what's going on and, and how do we handle that situation? So the technical side of flying is that you have to understand the how and the why behind why and how your airplane's flying. Oh, so yeah. that's a big part of it. Paperwork wise, we do have to fill out lots of like logbooks, so pilot logbooks, the aircraft journey logbooks. Uh, we're always tracking how everything's going. Uh, quality assurance within the aviation industry is a whole nother, you know, job like with, with what Chelsea does. But even like here at the, the flight school, we have a quality assurance manager who makes sure that all that safety stuff is being covered and, and, and taken care of. And you're crossing your T's and dotting your I's and signing your logbooks. And uh, so there is a bit of paperwork, but you learn it as you go and it, it doesn't feel as overwhelming when you're actually in it because it's, you know, you're applying it to what you're doing, which I think makes it more exciting. Uh, okay. Um, I can touch on that a bit more, Nova. Yeah. Um, I think the best advice I was ever given, I think it was like I was 15 years old, was if it's not written down, it didn't happen. <laughs> so when it comes to all of our, our, our positions and our careers, everything needs to be documented, especially mm -hmm. from um, a legislation side and a regulatory side. And it needs to be documented and needs to be followed up on quickly. And then you have to keep those records for minimum five to 10 years. So a lot of safety has, I would say it's 50-50. 50 percent of the time you're out in the field interacting with people, ensuring safety. And then the other 50 percent you're doing administrative work. Um, and that just all goes back to legislation, but yeah, it's just something to keep in mind. Everything needs to be documented. Well, and it sounds like there's a lot of communication in all of your jobs as well. So you obviously work with a lot of other people, um, besides just yourselves at, in your jobs. So who, and like, what other types of interactions do you guys have within the aviation world in your jobs? Mm, it's so connected. Um, I know, yeah. I, you know, both Chelsea and Dina, we've all been at presentations like this and can relate to a time where something's happened. And we've all had to work with each other and even more. So one of the, my favorite examples is an aircraft takes off. 
um, was just talking, you know, pilots were flying, just talking to the controller, flight attendants got everybody safe in the back, um, airport safe, all that's going on well, runways were cleared, and the airplane takes off and, you know, somebody sees that a wheel fell off. So holy crap, you know, bad day, <laughs> there's a wheel, it's come off this airplane. So now the chain of events starts happening where everybody starts working together. So maybe it was a passenger that tells the flight attendant that they saw something, right? So then the flight attendant's making sure the cabin is secure, talking to the pilots and working with them. The pilots are then talking to the air traffic controllers and coordinating, okay, well, what are we going to do? Can we land fueling? The airport is then checking the runway. What's going on? Where's this tire? Is it safe? You know, is, was there any debris on the runway? What's going on? Um, and then the mechanics are also involved now of like, okay, well, how do we fix this? tires it's safe to land so it's such an intricated in, that's i'm not saying that word properly but <laughs> <Intricate>. <laughs> you know what I'm, it's such a connected there we go yes. <laughs> mouth. but yeah. it's such a connected industry and like that's my favorite part about it all is that you're always meeting new people you're always working together and with different people that have different skill sets and the best thing about aviation i think is that you know everybody likes what they do so you're always working with people that are really passionate and and usually in a good mood, <laughs> which is pretty awesome as well. Yeah. I don't know, I'm yeah. sure, ladies, if you want to add to that. Well, I heard something in there that you and you talk as pilot to air traffic controllers. Yep. You and Dina want to tell us what that sounds like? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Why don't you give them a little a little sample of what sure. it sounds like? Um, so Faye okay. landed at several different airports. She's talked to several different types of controllers. Yeah. And I've looked at three different airports. So we'll use the example of the Edmonton International. More sure. Into. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess it would start off with me. I would be in my airplane. I will use, say, the Navajo. Uh, so I'm in the Navajo, which is one of the planes I fly out of the International, and I've done all my checks and everything, um, and I'm ready to enter uh, enter in um, my flight plan into the aircraft system. So before I do all of those button pushings and then get told it's wrong, <laughs> I'm going to start <laughs> off by calling clearance delivery. So I'm going to dial in the frequency. And I'm going to say clearance delivery. It's Piper Navajo Gulf Foxtrot Foxtrot India looking for the IFR to Calgary with information Charlie. Gulf Foxtrot Foxtrot India, Edmonton clearance, crew to Calgary by the Javon 1 departure flight plan route. Depart runway 12, squawk 4244. Okay, we're cleared for the Javon departure and 4244 for Foxtrot Foxtrot India. Foxtrot Foxtrot India, read back direct <laughs> information Oscar. Voxtrad, Voxtrad, India, check. We have information, Oscar. So in that case, if I said it wrong, she would have actually like corrected me, right? Usually I'd be writing all of this down. Um, okay, so then I enter in all my stuff and that's all good. And then I'm going to call, I'm going to switch frequencies and I'm going to now call a ground frequency. So I'm going to ask permission to taxi my airplane to the runway. So I'll say Edmonton ground, it's Navajo Gulf, Voxtrad, Voxtrad, India. We're at apron two looking for taxi. So yeah, and just to explain taxi is the is the actual correct term to use when an aircraft is yeah. driving. <laughs> yep. Oh yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gulf Fox Jeff Fox with India, Edmonton Ground, runway one two, wind one two zero at ten, altimeter two nine or nine or seven, taxi by Bravo, contact tower one one eight decimal three holding short. Okay, we'll taxi via Bravo for runway one two and we'll call the tower holding short. Gulf Fox Jeff Fox Road India. So now here we go, taxiing, da, 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 driving. <laughs> my airplane <laughs> to the runway um i'll do some more checks i get to the runway make sure everybody's ready to go in the back and then i'm going to switch frequencies again i'm now going to talk to the tower controller so i'll say edmonton tower hello it's Navajo Gulf foxtrot foxtrot india holding short runway one two ready for departure so and she's talking to the tower there's a imagine three different position and three different controllers we're all up in the tower and uh, we all have our headsets on so i can hear what my controller is saying on ground so i kind of know what's happening and i see that she's coming and so I'm ready and I'm already scanning my runways and my airborns to see if there's room for her to go and assuming everything's good to go. Gulf Fox, Red Fox, Red India, Edmonton Tower. Contact departure, who's the next controller IFR? Contact departure 133 decimal 65 airborne, clear for takeoff runway 12. Fox, Red Fox, Red India will contact departure 13365 on airborne, clear for departure 12. See ya. So long. Cool. <laughs> so now I'm taking off. I'm in the air and then I'm going to switch over and I'm going to call another controller. So funny enough, by the time I get to Calgary, I've probably already talked to like eight people, which is kind of amazing. Neat. Yeah, that's great. Thank you guys for doing that. That's really <laughs> exciting. It's a whole new language to a lot of people. I'm sure they've never heard before. <laughs> Mediation <laughs> jargon is real. <laughs> yeah, that's right. How about you, Chelsea? 
I was just going to say, whenever they do that, I just get so excited. And I think maybe yeah. it's the wrong career choice. <laughs> yeah, you could just have a pilot. You can do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess from the communication side, like that's so laid out and so specific and so trained. Um, from an airport side, though, not even safety, but from an airport, you're communicating with every aviation position, but then you're also communicating with everything around you. So if you, any of you have been to the Edmonton International Airport, we're located in Leduc County. And then we have Nisview around us. And then we have Leduc. And then we have the mall and the racetrack and Costco and all those good things. So all those areas actually land on Airport City and they're all considered tenants. So we have a lot of uh, tenant relations staff here. We have a lot of concession staff. So people that um, look after the, the restaurants inside the airport and you know wh where you get your coffee before you get on your plane. There's so many different people that you need to communicate with. But then we also have to communicate with our community. So Leduc County in the central region of Alberta, because a lot of the decisions that we make as an airport affect them. So you have um, people in stakeholder positions that are really specialized in government relations and community relations, um, and they can work at an airport as well. So any career that you think of, whether that's finance or IT or social media or pilots or safety, you can do at an airport and it all applies. The airport is its own little city and it needs all those positions to help run. So, Yeah, it's amazing. Well, I know we don't have too much time here because I know that uh, the Nelly Talks will continue with others, but I wanted to thank you all so much for sharing your career stories today and want to just kind of go around one more time and see if there's any like random facts or quick short stories that um, you've had in your experience and your positions, or even a word of advice to these young women who might be inspired to learn more about career in the careers in the aviation industry. Any last words? I do have a little story that's kind of funny. It's going to make you think a little bit. So it had been raining for three days. And uh, on day three or four, it was sunny out. And uh, an aircraft taxied out like Sophia and said, I'd like to request runway 20 or runway 20. And I said, unable, they're sweeping. And it was summertime. Now, Nova, I think the other two might be able to guess what they're sweeping for. <laughs> There's two things that they needed to sweep off of the runway before we could use it again. The pilot was actually quite surprised to hear this as well. Can you guess what two things they were sweeping off the runway? Summertime, just rained for three days. Worms? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the worms at the Edmonton International Airport look like snakes. They are huge. <laughs> <laughs> Kelsey, like, what is with that? Why are they so, uh, like, astonishingly <laughs> huge? Gross. Well, think about it this way. Like, the habitat that the airport is built on is all lush fields, all lush grass, and we take care of it really well. Um, also, we have no predators around because we don't want any nice. birds in the area. So these worms get to live forever and grow to the size of snakes. <laughs> And obviously when the rain comes out, then they come to the surface and yeah, we have to get rid of them. So they actually make the runway quite slippery and it's dangerous. To yeah. Absolutely. But there's another cool job in aviation, sweeping worms. <laughs> <laughs> that was my interesting tidbit. <laughs> That's awesome. You didn't tell us number two though, Gina. Oh, the rain, the water, you get some standing the water itself. Water. The drainage is there, but you do get standing water and that's also dangerous. Perfect. Right. Hydroplaning. Yeah. Hydroplaning, yes. How about, how about you, Sophia? Um, I don't know if I have any cool worm stories. Um, I know I get asked a lot by students about like, well, what happens when things go wrong or if I've ever crashed, all those kind of things. Um, no, I've never crashed and I hope I never do. Um, but I've definitely had in-flight issues or, you know, even before you go flying issues. And that's why we're always like doing a walk around and always checking the aircraft. And so I've recently had, um, we were flying and I just, I, we look out the, the right window and there's fuel pouring out of the wing. And because the, the fuel's in the wings of aircraft. And so the, the, when the, we had our, our awesome fueler, who's a wonderful guy, great aviation job, just didn't screw the cap on quite tight enough. And so there's fuel coming out of the wing. And so we're halfway from almost like getting close to Edmonton, kind of on our way from Calgary to Fort McMurray. And you have to make those decisions of, okay, well, do, do I land in Edmonton or do I keep going to Fort McMurray or do I turn around and go back to Calgary or, you know, what are my options here? How much fuel do I have? How much am I losing? Um, so it's, it's kind of neat that way of like, 
it was just another one of those things where you really have to use your brain and think about like, Hmm, okay, what's the best thing for me to do here? And your training kicks in. And I always find that so cool when you put all this work into training and you actually have to use it. Um, which I, just, I don't know. I just, I, I love that part about our job is that you really are making decisions and, and having to, to utilize all that information. So that's pretty cool. Um, I guess fun fact, well, here's one we've kind of mentioned and uh, less people talk about how you well, can't be a pilot. If you have glasses yes. proof, you can. <laughs> um, so yeah, an aviation medical, you can wear glasses all you like. Uh, there's certain things like colorblindness. There's some restrictions, but uh, you can still even fly if you're colorblind, depending on the type of colorblindness. So there you go. Oh, there you go. Very interesting. How about you, Chelsea? Uh, a cool thing that not a lot of people know, um, Transport Canada requires us to do a full-scale emergency exercise every second year. So that goes to the extent of like, we fake a plane crash at the airport. We have volunteers that are dressed up in raggedy clothes and bloody makeup and everything. And they're acting as people that have crashed in this airport. Uh, we deploy all of our services, including teaming up with the county of Leduc and the city of Edmonton. And we have all this fake airplane crash going on. And then we also have our full um, emergency op operation center running. So making the decisions, okay, how are we gonna get the air air airport back up and running as soon as possible? How many ambulances do we need? Where hospitals are they going to? What kind of hotels do we need for friends and families? So we reenact this entire situation and it takes about a full day to do. Uh, a lot of times we get to video it, there's media around and stuff, but that's something cool that we get to do in our job and we get to do it every two years. So. And it's really funny. We get to be an actor in it. Yeah. <laughs> um, we try and do it in the summer too. So it's warm out. Nobody has yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> <They're cool. laughs> um, but then I guess a word of advice is I, I I've heard mm. this, and I've been told it a couple of times, but just give your hundred percent on your first day as you would as your last day. So you never quit trying. You're giving a hundred percent, no matter what. Uh, aviation is a very connected industry and mm -hmm. wherever you go, somebody's going to know of you or know you. So you never want to uh, put in less effort than you have to. And like I said, just keep trying. When I got hired here on the airport, um, I attended my first interview. I, I kind of thought, oh yeah, it's a shoe in I did really well. Five interviews later, <laughs> I had <laughs> because they, they weren't sure that I was the right candidate. And I kept showing up every interview on time, making sure that I gave my 100% effort and it worked out for me in the end. So yeah, don't give up. Such good advice, such good advice. I think that's in everything in aviation, right? Like Dina, you know, I'm, you and I could definitely relate to that in, in our training, especially of there's times that you're like, oh my God, what have I decided to do here? <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's, or you think, oh, can I do this? Like you second guess yourself and maybe, I don't know, I find women were the worst at that. Of we, we go, well, am I good enough for this? Can I do it? Da, da, da. Um, and you can, you just have to keep working, find, find what, where your break is um is it you're not understanding the why like what's the problem and just if you really want this if it's something you, you like truly desire don't let anything get in your way and, and keep fighting for it well said yeah i love that well and, and said from our mentorship uh our <laughs> mentorship right so you know when you find those tough times or you're heading into challenges that you just don't know how to manage and you don't think you're going to get through that's something that we do at elevate we can pair you up with a mentor and you know somebody who's been through it themselves and can help you work your your way through those problems and help problem solve for you so that you can keep pushing through <laughs> yeah yeah it's always good to ask for help <laughs> always okay to ask for help absolutely well thank you ladies for joining us today um again Elevate's been really fortunate to be able to participate in this Nelly talk. And we hope that you enjoyed learning a little bit about some of these different careers that we have in aviation. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.